Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. U.S. urges Israel to extend settlement freeze. Iran blasts IAEA report as politically driven. And Pakistan floods sound alarm on climate change. Mosaic World News from Middle East begins now. Palestinian and Israeli sources said that the U.S. administration has proposed the extension of the settlement moratorium for three additional months to give the demarcation of borders a chance. In a meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton in Ramallah, Abbas said that the Palestinian side welcomes all efforts, especially those being exerted by U.S. President Barack Obama for a lasting peace. Abbas further said that everyone knows that the talks are the only way to achieve peace. It's worth mentioning that the U.S. proposal aims to bypass the obstacle of September 26, when the settlement moratorium set by the Israeli government is due to expire. Joining us from Jerusalem is our Al Jazeera bureau chief, Walid al Umuri. Walid, what are the details of the U.S. proposal and what type of reactions has it generated? First, the proposal is a new mechanism drafted and introduced by the Americans in an attempt to bypass the obstacle of September 26, which marks the end of the 10 month partial settlement moratorium announced by the Israeli government. According to verifiable information, the proposal calls on both sides to engage in dialogue on the border demarcation of the Palestinian state in the West Bank for three months. During that period, Israel may resume construction in settlements located outside these borders or in areas that will remain under its control. A new round of talks was followed by a new round of Israeli airstrikes and met by a barrage of missiles launched from the Gaza Strip. Israeli warplanes carried out pre-dawn raids in the Gaza Strip, striking several Palestinian targets, including a Hamas training base and a factory in the south. There have been no casualty reports. However, a Palestinian man was martyred and two others were wounded yesterday in an Israeli airstrike. Israel says the raid was in response to the launch of a missile and two mortar shells that were fired from the Gaza Strip at northern Israel. On the political front, the vast majority of the Palestinian public has expressed pessimism over the resumption of direct talks with the Israeli side. The Palestinians expressed doubt that the negotiations will lead to the creation of their future state, especially as Israel clings to its position on settlement construction. They have been talking for years about the two-state solution, meaning an independent Palestinian state next to an independent Israeli state. So far, we have only seen an independent Israeli state. There's no sign of a Palestinian state. They will freeze settlement construction when hell freezes over. This is because the settlers are very attached to their settlements. After leading efforts in bringing the Palestinians and the Israelis to the bargaining table, U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East, George Mitchell, held talks in Damascus with Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Mitchell informed al-Assad of the way in which Israeli-Palestinian direct talks are heading. In addition, the U.S. envoy held similar talks in the Lebanese capital, Beirut. The European Union, which launched today its summit in Brussels, plans to urge Israel to extend its settlement moratorium, which is due to expire on September 26. The EU said in its final statement that the summit leaders will urge Israel to take steps to achieve peace, not only with the Palestinians, but with Syria and Lebanon as well. Joining us via phone is our correspondent in Brussels, Ali Mohammed Ahmed. Ali, how will the EU's support for extending the Israeli settlement moratorium in the West Bank play out on the direct talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis? 
اعتقد ان الاتحاد الاوروبي اراد ان يوجه رساله الى كل المنطقه I believe that the EU wanted to send a message to the whole region, saying there's no need to add new obstacles on the road to peace, especially considering the many challenges facing the direct talks, particularly the settlement issue. The EU, through its final statement, is seeking to renew its commitment to sharing responsibilities in the region. Also, the EU is trying to reclaim its position among the leading powers, including the U.S., which is trying to marginalize the EU's role in the region. Israel has rejected acknowledging the EU's position or accepting it as a partner in the peace process. The EU was careful to draw attention to the situation in Gaza, saying that the status quo must be changed. It also proposed opening other channels of dialogue in the region, mainly with Syria and Lebanon. The EU, which is seeking to develop its foreign policy, is seizing on these direct talks by proposing new plans in order to remind us of its important position in the region. Our correspondent, Ali Mohamed Ahmed, thank you for joining us from Brussels. On the ongoing peace process, His Majesty reiterated that a two-state solution remains the only way to realize an independent and viable Palestinian state that enjoys security and peace side by side with Israel. During the meeting, Clinton briefed His Majesty on developments in the direct Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, which began in Washington earlier this month and resumed in Sharm el-Sheikh and this week in Jerusalem. His Majesty valued the U.S. administration's efforts to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and arrive at a two-state solution. He also stressed on the need for the United States to continue to assume a leading role to ensure progress in the ongoing negotiations. Following her meeting with His Majesty the King, the U.S. Secretary of State held a joint news conference with Foreign Minister Nasser Judeh. Clinton praised Jordan's unwavering commitment to peace in the region and commended His Majesty the King's efforts to help advance Arab-Israeli peace efforts. The U.S. Secretary also hailed Jordan's contribution to peacekeeping efforts in different parts of the world and pledged the U.S. continued assistance to Jordan to carry out developmental projects. I also thank the government and people of Jordan for your efforts uh, on behalf of peacekeeping missions around the world, where Jordan has proven time and time again to be a force for peace and progress. And of course, as Nasser said, Jordan is a crucial partner working to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and bring a comprehensive peace to the Middle East. We were honored to host uh, King Abdullah II in Washington as these talks got underway. And I want to publicly thank him, as I privately have, for his contributions uh, both to the resumption of direct negotiations and to the constructive beginning uh, that has occurred. Jordan's steadfast support for this process is essential. And today, His Majesty and I uh, discussed ongoing negotiations, and I expressed my confidence that Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas can make the difficult decisions necessary to resolve all of the core issues within one year. The Arab League is holding a meeting in Cairo, after which the ministers are expected to announce their rejection of the Israeli demand to recognize Israel as a Jewish state, and their support for the Palestinian demand to stop settlement construction. The delegates presented the Council with several draft resolutions on the necessity of backing direct negotiations with Israel, on the basis of the peace process and the specific time frame. In addition, they requested that the United States pressure Israel to stop settlement construction. The Lebanese March 14th coalition has accused Hezbollah of trying to overthrow the international tribunal. This accusation came after the head of Hezbollah's parliamentary bloc, Mohamed Rad, said that the regulations of the international tribunal were established without the approval of parliament. Hezbollah insists on the importance of trying those it describes as false witnesses in the ongoing international investigation into the assassination of former Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri. The Lebanese March 14th coalition accused Hezbollah and some of its allies, most notably parliament member Michel Aoun, of trying to plot a coup, the aim of which is to restore the situation in the country to what it was before 2005. 
According to these forces, the most notable facet of this attempt is the overthrowing of the International Special Tribunal for the prosecution of the assassination of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq al-Hariri. We reject Hezbollah's insistence on holding the Lebanese situation hostage to foreign interests. We reject it because it will lead to great devastation. We have learned from the bitter experiences we had with forces who came before Hezbollah and who engaged in similar adventures. On the other hand, Hezbollah believes that the International Tribunal has become a tool for creating what it called chaos in Lebanon and that it will continue to challenge the system of the court. In addition, it called on trying those it referred to as false witnesses who misled the International investigation for years by accusing Syria and some of its allies of being behind Hariri's assassination. In regards to the false witnesses, what matters is who is behind them, who fabricated them, who produced them, who gave them the instructions to make the statements they did during the investigation. In turn, we have to go after the main figures who orchestrated this event. In my opinion, this is the duty of the Lebanese state, the Lebanese government, and the Lebanese judiciary. This file's other facet is the request of former General Security Department Chief Major General Jamil al Said to jail and punish prominent leaders of the judiciary and internal security security services for leaving him in jail for almost four years. He was accused of taking part in the assassination of Rafiq al-Hariri based on statements of those being described as false witnesses. Jamil El Said triggered the anger of the March 14th coalition when he said that he will seek justice by himself if the judicial system and Premier Said Hariri won't deliver. Amidst all this uproar, Lebanese President Michel Suleiman asked that doubt over the constitutional and judicial institutions be put to an end and that the plots against brotherly and friendly nations be stopped. Some analysts believe that this uproar will not affect the Syrian-Saudi understanding on Lebanon. In a joint press conference with his Pakistani counterpart in Islamabad, Afghan President Hamid Karzai said that restoring peace in both countries requires the opening of dialogue with the Taliban as opposed to military action. Karzai's visit comes as U.S. forces continue to pound Taliban positions in the state of Waziristan. In its latest military escalation, U.S. drones carried out airstrikes against the Taliban, killing more than 12 armed fighters, as confirmed by Pakistani security sources. Mayhub Khudr reports from Islamabad. One eye is focusing on the elections and security, while the other is maintained on the Taliban and the success of dialogue with them. These are some of the issues occupying the agenda of Afghan President Hamid Karzai during his visit to Pakistan. The visit comes amidst stormy relations, strained by doubt and mistrust between the two sides. The two sides are in disagreement over the Taliban and its growing influence across their territories, which prompted them to call for dialogue with the Taliban. We are continuing our campaign. While continuing our military campaign against the terrorists in their networks, we will continue to explore other options to restore peace in Afghanistan and Pakistan. This includes meeting and holding dialogue with members of the Taliban who don't have any ties to al-Qaeda and who are willing to abide by the articles of the Afghan constitution. Pakistan said that it would be difficult to achieve peace and stability in the region without the Taliban, whether by using force against them or holding talks with them. Pakistan is part of the solution and not part of the problem. Our relations with Afghanistan are moving forward and we are seeking to further boost them. Having said that, we need to seek wider military and intelligence cooperation in order to achieve better results. Pakistan was careful in its goal to shun India and limit its influence on the Afghan scene. Meanwhile, Karzai acknowledged the importance of Islamabad in any foreseeable political settlement with the Taliban. Karzai feels that he needs the support of Pakistan in order for him or his party to remain in power and be part of the political process. It will be impossible for the Americans to directly deal with the Taliban via Pakistan, leaving Karzai out of the picture. 
In between the Afghan and Pakistani positions, U.S. missiles continue to light the skies of Waziristan. The U.S. has intensified its attacks in an attempt to force the Taliban to answer the calls for dialogue. Between his accusation against Pakistan of harboring Afghan Taliban leaders and his efforts to seek cooperation with Islamabad, including security, election, and talks with the Taliban, the positions of President Karzai seem to fluctuate. Observers believe that there's only one explanation for that, which is to allow Karzai to cling to power at any cost. Mahiyub Huder, Dubai TV, Islamabad. Hi, I'm Jamal Dejani, producer of Mosaic World News from the Middle East, and I'm here with some important news. Mosaic wants to bring our unique brand of news to stations throughout the United States. We want to raise $100,000 during this month-long pledge drive so we can bring Mosaic to new stations and let more and more Americans get real reporting from the Middle East. When you pledge your support today with a contribution of $100 or more, you receive this great Mosaic Intelligence Report t-shirt. It asks, do you have intelligence? Do you? Of course you do. We know you do because you watch the Mosaic Intelligence Report. So show your love for Mosaic and Mir by getting this t-shirt with your $100 contribution today. If you step up your contribution up to $1,000 today, you'll get the ultimate Mosaic fan experience and have lunch with me. You'll also get an inside look at how Mosaic is produced the next time you're in San Francisco. Show your support today by calling us at 1-866-485-8848 or head on over to our website at linktv.org and click on the Give Now button. Show your support today and help keep this unique and thought-provoking program on the air. Thank you. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad dismissed the impact of any additional sanctions on his country due to its nuclear program. Ahmadinejad's statements coincided with the growing dispute between Tehran and the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, over Iran's refusal to allow two agency inspectors from inspecting its sites. The confrontation between Iran and Western powers over Tehran's nuclear program has reached the IAEA halls and corridors. This war of words was ignited by Tehran's refusal to allow two inspectors from entering the country. It is accusing them of committing an error in the agency's latest report. The United States believes that this action is an Iranian attempt to scare the inspectors in order to affect the results of the investigation into its nuclear program. Well, the United States and I think other member states are very concerned because... Well, the United States and I think other member states are very concerned because this is the first time, really, in the history of the agency that, based on a report of the Director General, the state that's being investigated, in this case Iran, objects to the presence of inspectors who are involved in the investigation. So what they've done is they've sent a signal to the Secretariat and to the Inspectorate that if they do their job and tell the truth, that they might be penalized for it and prevented from continuing their work. If they come and they do their job. For its part, Iran believes its decision was made in line with its right, which is enshrined in the international agency's regulations and grants Iran the right to accept or refuse the agency's inspectors. According to Comprehensive Safeguard Agreement. According to comprehensive security measures, Iran or any other state has the right to vet inspectors on the basis of nationality. It is clearly stated that it is not necessary to explain a country's refusal to allow their entry. I have said that those two inspectors committed an error and that it is important to rectify the report with an additional supplement. If not, we have no choice but to refuse their return. The West is accusing Iran of attempting to produce nuclear weapons and is demanding that it stops enriching uranium and open up its nuclear facilities for the inspectors of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Meanwhile, Tehran denies these accusations and says that the intent of its nuclear program is peaceful. It insists that it aims to generate electricity, which will be used for medical and agricultural purposes. Tehran's insistence on moving forward in its enrichment activities pushed Western powers to impose a new round of sanctions on the country in June 2010.
كما أن التقرير الأخير للوكالة In addition, the agency's latest report indicated that a number of seals placed by the inspectors on Iran's stockpile of low enriched uranium had been broken and that the production of enriched uranium has increased by 15% despite the international sanctions. The inspectors considered what is happening between Iran and the West as a challenge to the United Nations resolutions and the international sanctions. However, Tehran says that these procedures are an expression of its rejection of American and Western hegemony over international institutions. Khalil Lubad, BBC. BBC. Environmental experts say that as mortality rates due to natural disasters continue to decline, climate change is threatening to increase their occurrence due to extreme climate conditions and the effects associated with them, such as the spread of diseases and malnutrition. تراجع نسبة الوفيات الناجمة عن الكوارث الطبيعية بفضل نظم توقع الأعاصير وموجات الحرارة. The decline in mortality rates caused by natural disasters due to early warning systems dedicated to hurricanes and heat waves did not prevent the UN environmental organizations from renewing their warning of the many factors revolving around the issue of climate change. These challenges, along with the spread of disease, malnutrition, drought, wildfires, rising temperatures, floods, mudslides, and rising sea levels, call for the doubling of international national efforts in order to reduce their risks, most notably the real threat facing world population, which is expected to increase to 9 billion by the year 2050. In addition, mortality rates are expected to double by the year 2030. In another development, the UN Environment Program indicates that countering the spread of disease due to floods, hurricanes and storms can be achieved through preparedness, issuance of early warning alerts and the opening of shelters. This has largely helped reduce the number of fatalities in various disasters, such as those that struck Bangladesh and Cuba. According to emergency alert centers, more than 300,000 people were killed in Hurricane Paula in 1970, while 139,000 were killed in a hurricane in 1991. Over the years, the number of hurricane-related deaths continues to decline. In 1970, nearly 3,500 people were killed in Hurricane Cedar. ليتراجع عدد الوفيات في العام 2007 إلى 3,500 شخص جراء الأعصار سيدر. According to studies conducted by UN organizations, the recent floods that swept Pakistan sounded alarm bells on climate change. The UN has urged the world's countries to take swift measures to control the situation and advise them not to take lightly the effects of local floods. Hussein Shahada, Al Arabiya. Salam Yassin, an economic advisor to the Iraqi government, said that Baghdad has formed a ministerial committee to discuss its numerous outstanding issues with Erbil, most notably oil and gas exports. The issue, which recently caused uproar in Baghdad, has strained relations between the two sides. Meanwhile, Iraqi Ministry of Oil spokesman Asim Jihad said that disputes between the Kurdistan regional government, the KRG, and the Iraqi government remain unresolved. Jihad further said that improving relations between the KRG and the Iraqi government will increase the country's overall crude oil exports due to their joint efforts. On the Baghdad Erbil line, a sign of breakthrough in the oil crisis started to appear on the horizon. The oil crisis is straining relations between the central government of Baghdad and the Kurdistan regional government of Erbil. Salam Yassin, an economic advisor to the outgoing Iraqi government, said that they have formed a ministerial committee to discuss the outstanding issues between Baghdad and Erbil. Yassin said that the committee will discuss numerous issues with the KRG most notably gas and oil exports, which have recently caused uproar in Baghdad. He added that the committee will soon start its work to resolve the differences over KRG's gas exports, the constitutionality of which is being challenged by the Iraqi Ministry of Oil. In another development, Iraqi Ministry of Oil spokesman Asim Jihad said that disputes between the KRG and the central government remain unresolved. Jihad further said that improving the relations between the KRG and the Iraqi government will increase the country's crude oil exports due to joint efforts.
The relations between Baghdad and Erbil took a turn for the worse when the Iraqi Ministry of Oil said it will export oil exclusively via the Suom Company, rendering all contracts signed with the Ministry of Natural Resources in the Kurdistan region unconstitutional. However, the KRG said that such a move by Baghdad undermines the supreme interest of the nation. In an attempt to attract more international companies to the private sector, Iraq has eased requirements facing international oil companies, which took part in the third bidding round to develop three gas fields, namely Akas, Mansuria, and Siba in Basra. Work at these three fields is set to begin in early October. Under the new terms, the winning companies don't have to pay large sums of money upon signing contracts. The international companies have paid between 100 and 500 million dollars in the first two rounds of bidding. Experts believe that Iraq's decision to ease the bidding requirements is part of the ongoing efforts to raise gas production to its maximum level. Under the new terms, the winning companies can export 50 percent of their production of natural gas, with the other 50 percent getting allocated to the Iraqi government. The Iraqi Ministry of Oil plans to increase the level of oil exports to more than 12 million barrels a day, which has been approved by OPEC. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online, stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.